Hey everyone, my name is Eric Jones and I am the Turf Teacher. We're going to look at a, a PowerPoint that I put together titled Sign Inventory and Analysis. Now, you may think, why do I need to do this? Well, I think whether if you're in the design business, the install business, the irrigation business, you need to do an inventory and analysis of your client's property. And why is that? You need to know what's there. Take inventory. What is there? What's on site? And then when your experts teach, you're going to come up with an analysis. So, but before you do the site inventory and analysis, what should you have you already done? You should have already consulted with the client. You should have met with them. And before that, you should have made that determination, hey, this is the client that I want to work for. So you're meeting them on site, whether it's at the kitchen table or walking around the property if it's a new home, and you've already got the information uh, from the client over the phone and hopefully hopefully you asked for a site plan and that site plan you should have taken and blew up drawn it a little bit bigger than needed to be either on a legal sheet of paper a tabloid sheet of paper an 18 by 24 sheet of paper or even going up to the next size of a 24 by 36 it just depends on if it's a design or if this is an install job and when I say install job uh, guys, it can be either for irrigation or landscaping. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't, have to, doesn't necessarily just have to be for design. It can be an install. So if it's an install job or an irrigation job, I may put it on a smaller sheet of paper. And um, if I'm doing a design, maybe a little bit bigger. That's your preference, though. But you've got your, your site inventory. You've got your site plan. You've met with the client. You've got 100 million pictures on your phone or your iPad. And now you're getting ready to do your site inventory and analysis. And that's what that lecture is going to help you do um, with taking, taking um, this inventory and this analysis. So objectives, we're going to know the process of collecting and analyzing. Uh, the inventory. Uh, we're going to understand the role of analysis in the landscape or irrigation design. And again, not just for design, but for if we're in, if we're doing an install for for the client. And then learn the importance of circulation, views, and site conditions. So again, I want you to know inventory is collecting is collecting the data that's there. You're taking inventory of your plant material, the type of grass, the type of mulch whether it's a brick paver patio, concrete, you're writing down everything that's there for this client. And then analysis uh, is going to say, what do I need to do with this? Do I need to incorporate it in the design? Do I need to incorporate it in the new planting that I'm doing? Uh, or do I need to move this sidewalk? Uh, or do I need to bore underneath this sidewalk for the irrigation system? It's your expert advice to the client or you telling the client this is going to have to be done and then the last one there with circulation views and site conditions that's more or less if we are designing for the client so again inventory is fact analysis is the evaluation and action that we're going to have with uh, with the with the inventory that we've just taken and whether or not you do this in a nice drawing for the client that's totally up to you you still need to do it for yourself um, in landscape architecture I've seen this be two separate drawings when we were when we were in undergrad we would do a site inventory plan and we would do a site analysis plan in some of the, the smaller residential landscape design classes, we may put inventory and analysis together, and it depends on the property and the size of the property. But a residential home, you could probably have it all on one plan. Now, for residential landscape design, you may or may not let your client see this other than at the kitchen table. You may want to sit down with them and kind of go over it. And this inventory and analysis should be talked about within the client consultation on site. Again, you may have watched the client consultation lecture first, or you may have watched this one first, but before we sit down with that client at the kitchen table, we need to do this inventory and analysis and write it on the site plan that you got from them on the initial phone call, or you went to Geodata and pulled that information. And it's easier to, to sit down at the kitchen table and kind of explain this what's going on. It's better to use symbols versus words 
uh, when we're sitting when we're sitting there at the table. Makes you look a lot like you makes you look like you know what's going on. It, it's it's um, and especially the symbols. They're like wow. They've took the time to to walk around my property and, and do this sketching on this on this survey of my yard. It makes me feel comfortable with them. So you need to have that site survey, which you should have gotten the phone call. The big clipboard that I talked about in client consultation. The tape measure, one on your hip. Have a hundred foot tape too with a screwdriver that you can take longer measurements. Uh, colored pens or markers, colored pencils. Uh, I love those, and I love um, you know. Uh, colored markers. It's a lot easier to, to write this stuff up pretty quick and it's easier to, to separate it by the color. The digital camera and the compass. We talked about that in the last lecture. Ooh, all on the cell phone. You can get a lot of data that you need right from the cell phone. Uh, the digital camera or a, I like an iPad because it's a little bit bigger and the clients can sit there and scroll through and you can scroll through. You've got that site playing late on the kitchen table that you've wrote all these notes on and you're scrolling through on the iPad of pictures and you're pointing to it, pointing to the picture and exactly where it's at on the plan and it lets that client know, know what's going on. And then we need to know where north is that way based on the plant material that we're installing uh, we can have um, where they need to be. We don't need to plant a uh, azalea on the hot western side of a home uh, if that's one of our clients favorite plants. So in the uh, inventory analysis we need to look at areas and situations. Again inventory is recording what is present on site and observing any problem areas that the client may have. So a problem is an inventory. Wet spot in the lawn is an inventory. Um, low spots um, e anything, anything and everything is the inventory. It's, it's what's there, whether it be that wet spot in the lawn, whether it is a, uh, an irrigation head that's leaking. The analysis is to take action in response to the inventory. So that low spot, we may need to add some, some subsurface drainage, or we may need to, um, look at where the gutters are coming down. All of that, um, Figuring out why, um, not necessarily say figuring out why, but our solution to that problem. Even the problems are considered inventory. How we fix it is considered the analysis or our expert opinion on what we're going to do. Now, with some of the symbols I talked about, um, utility, you know, write in utility on the box, that's fine. But, you know, boulder, we're drawing just a rock, a specimen tree. Um, if we need to screen out that utility box, we're just screening it with some squiggly lines. Um, if we wanted to move that boulder, we just use the arrow. Uh, a lot of this, I'm not going to do so much writing on the plan as I am the symbols. Now, some of you may be a little bit different and write more. In other designers, you're going to see different. They're going to take more notes. They might not use as many symbols. I like the symbols because for one, it's hard to steal that idea from you. People can look and read words and like, ah, okay, I know what he's talking about. And like I said, I've had one design stolen in the past and I'll never have one stolen again from me. We learn the hard way. Um, these thick arrows here, I like using uh, um, Sharpies. I like using fat magic markers and, and kind of using them on the plan and uh, hopefully I can put some pictures up um, at the end of this lecture or maybe a little quick video on how to draw some of this stuff but at least have some pictures uh, of how to of what these little arrows should look like if we're using colored pens and markers it's real quick and real easy but again talked about getting that site plan from the client blowing it up on a larger piece of paper Got an excellent view there. They're rotating there. Open area, good for herbs or bed. Screen in the fence. Need to screen this view. Could be a good area for a walk. Uh, foundation needs help. A good work area for the client. Keep that open. So there must be some good views there. Uh, screen the power pole, uh, uh, the utility pole there it's in the front yard. Um, got a live oak there that they'd probably want to keep. 
Um, you know, so you're writing all kinds of information about the property, and you're walking around the property with this site plan. You're writing down this information, put the clipboard down, you take a bunch of pictures, and you have this idea and this knowledge of the property. And you're, again, you're the problem solver for the client. You're going to show them um, what's there. Because sometimes it's hard for people to even realize it. And, and a view is an inventory. You might, some people, you know, I've had students in the past think that that would be an analysis. Well, that's your opinion that that's a good view. No, a good view is, or an open view is what's there. And a lot of times those views may not be what you actually think. It could be a tree on another person's property. Uh, it could be if we had a scraggly looking old tree here, that would be part of the inventory. Part of the inventory could be possible good view. The analysis is if we took down that tree, we've got a good looking view. We've got a view that we can see. So hopefully you're getting the difference between the inventory and the analysis. Inventory is what's there, whether it's a good view, bad view, potential view. Analysis is how we get to that or we maintain that. Note, other items to note, house color. We want to uh, notate the color of the house and the type of building materials. And why would we want to note that? We want to note this because uh, we may not want to plant Delaware Valley white azaleas in front of a house that either has white brick, painted white brick, or white vinyl siding. The customer really loves azaleas, so we may need to go with some corabels or something else. We don't want to make that mistake of having white flowers upon a white house or red flowers up against a red brick. That's not doing our clients any justice. We're the problem solvers for them, and we're supposed to design them and give them what they want. So don't do that. Doors and windows. We need to know, especially with the windows, the height of the window, because you don't want to plant anything that's going to grow up above that window or be a pruning nightmare for them in the future. Uh, you need to know where the doors are because if you're going to put a deck or a patio, you want to make sure that you're doing it where the door is. Now, because when you're looking at that site plan, all you're seeing is the outline of the house. When you go and do the site inventory and analysis, part of the inventory is where are those windows? Where are those doors? And you write that on your plan so you know exactly where they're at. Note where the rooms are. Why do you want to know where the rooms are? Well, you want the deck to come off either the kitchen uh, or the dining room, however the house is laid out, but you want to have access and you want good access to the kitchen because you're probably cooking inside, you got a grill set up or an outdoor kitchen uh, on the patio, you want to have access to and from the indoor and outdoor kitchens or the entertainment center. You don't want to put the deck um, off to the side where it's only accessible through the master bedroom. You want to make sure that guests and, and people that are coming over to the house can can easily get to the outdoor entertaining areas. And so make note of that on the site inventory and analysis where these rooms are. Now, also when it comes to rooms, you need to take into consideration views. Now, I don't like going to people's bedrooms, so I'm not going to ask to see that but when I meet with the client at the kitchen table I'm gonna look out the kitchen window I'm gonna look out the dining room window I'm gonna look out the foyer and the living room windows and I'm gonna see if there's any potential views or even bad views and that's part of my inventory and what would I need to do about that would be the analysis that I'm coming up and it's some people may not even realize that they could have that good view uh, with just removing a you know a, um, you know, a tree or, or, or opening up a view to another person's client. And I think, it, I think there's a picture in here that actually, when we're talking about views, the client actually has a live oak that is just gorgeous in shape. And they wanted to keep that view visible from their client's house. So on your site plan, again, just keep, uh, you know, simple. They're writing here, we have an office. We got the kitchen, the window's four foot from the ground on the kitchen. There's the door. 
We've got the two bedrooms and we've got a dining room. So if we were putting a deck on this house, we would definitely want it to come off the kitchen and possibly come over to the office. Um, but that's a large window, but we definitely got to have it where the door is, the deck. And then maybe we'd put some steps and go down to have a patio here or something. So just depends on the property. You just need to know where where the rooms are inside the the home. Items to note again, circulation. Um, how, how do people uh, park? Um, are they having to use parking on the street? Uh, is grandma and grandpa moved into the house? Are they staying on the first floor? And do they, do they have to park on the street because the driveway is not big enough? Uh, is the children still in the house? Are they of driving age? How many children do they have? Do they have two twins? I mean, do they have a set of twins that's seniors in high school and then a sophomore? Do you have three kids that are driving? Grandma and grandpa's had to move in, so they brought their car. Or both you and your spouse have a car. So how many vehicles and what, what, what is, how does that play in the role? Um, is the driveway continuously full of cars and are you having to use on-street parking? That's part of circulation and that needs to be noted uh, in the inventory. Part of the analysis might be we need to widen the driveway or have a parking space made out of brick pavers added to the right side of the driveway so grandma can park her car. What are the primary paths? When we say that, that's the sidewalk from the street to the front door and that's the sidewalk from the driveway to the front door. Secondary paths are going to be paths that would lead you to the back that could either be made out of rock dust, stepping stones. Typically, they're not, they're not hardscapes. They're not, they're not pavers or concrete all the way to the back. Some people may have that, but usually they're like stepping stones and, or a, a mulched path with, with a, a stepping stone in between that. Very, very um, simple pathways, but they are paths that take people from the front to the back. Example, child might be having a birthday party. Mom doesn't want all these kids coming through the front door to get to the, to the play area in the back. So you have a, a secondary path that people can walk around the house to get to, um, to the back play area on the birthday party. And what is the pavement uh, for these circulation paths? Is it the stepping stones for the secondary or is it just mulched? Is the, con is the driveway concrete or is it asphalt or is it a brick paver? Uh, and then primary, so a primary pass, are they concrete walks or brick paver sidewalk? All that needs to be noted. Um, and here's how we would actually draw our, uh, our, um, our circulation pass. Now, we're drawing the primary well, we've got the we've got the uh, the driveway coming into the garage there, and this is a different house. It's not the same on the, uh, the primary picture, um, the first picture we saw. But our primary uh, is going to be like your paved sidewalks or potential primary path from the street. You, we are having to use um, on street parking, so we need to have a sidewalk to the front door. We have people pull in to the driveway. We need to have a sidewalk to get to the front door. So that's going to be your hardscape, uh, either existing or analysis. They need to be added. So we're taking inventory of what's there, and then we're going to have analysis of what needs to be there, or this needs to be widened, this needs to be moved. And then with your secondary or pathways around the house, which is your stepping stone, the mulch pass, whatever. They're just little single lines with the uh, with the arrows pointing to it. And these are real, real easy to draw, guys. I mean, simple and sweet, done with a sharpie on the site plan that you're using, or you're taking the fat magic marker and drawing these little blocks, and you're putting them, uh, uh, outlining them with a sharpie, and then like a little felt tip pen. So little nice ways to, to pop those circulation paths. Note the utilities. Note if it's overhead wires coming into the house, where the trash receptacles are, uh, where the AC units are, the transformers, 
And then if they have a septic tank, where is the septic? We always want to know where the septic tank is because, you know, mama's saying that she wants a, a, a maple tree uh, for shade or she's wanting a willow oak for shade. Well, you can't do that near a septic, uh, septic lines because those roots will destroy it. So note that, find out where that's at. Find out where the trash receptacles are. Maybe you need to have a secondary path over to the trash cans. Or maybe you need to pour a little cement pad to set the trash cans on. Because little Billy, when he takes the trash out, is stepping in the grass and he's bringing in wet grass when it's raining or mud or anything like that. So, again, that would be part of your inventory and analysis. Uh, inventory. Trash cans are in a mud spot. Analysis would be, let's add some brick pavers there or pour a concrete slab to put these trash cans on. Uh, AC units are on the left side of the house. That's inventory. Analysis is they're ugly. Uh, mama don't like seeing them, so maybe we need to uh, put a little fence around them that's acceptable by, uh, by the heat and air uh, company. Uh, or let's plant some shrubs around it or something that can hide it definitely from uh, the street. Transformer, yeah, we need to plant something around it, not too close, because Duke Power is not going to like that, or Duke Energy. And then, what do we do about these overheads? Well, for one, take note of them. They're there. Analysis is we can't plant anything underneath them because they'll come and cut them down. Again, for the septic tank, the, uh, the trees are just growing into it. Um, you wouldn't want to have any type of uh, aggressive root trees, maples, or anything that's going to love the water. Uh, you know, you may want to plant uh, a good ways from it, or at least plant something that doesn't have the aggressive roots. But um, I would recommend not planting anything on the septic lines. Overhead lines, again, you cannot plant trees underneath them because they will come and top them. And I've actually seen municipalities do this, uh, guys, that, that have a, uh, an arborist on staff. They have um, a city arborist, and they're going in and they're planting maples or they're planting uh, um, larger trees that they're going to have to cut in a few years. And then they're going back and replacing them or they're topping them. So, again, take note of that and, and tell your client that you can't plant anything underneath them. Um, again, like I just said, we're going to note the air conditioning units, the trash cans, the storage areas, other utilities. Uh, they may need a they may need a little um, outbuilding to park the lawnmower. They may need a place for the dog, so you may want to uh, sell them a fence in the back. Um, or if you're noticing where the dog has done its pathway, they'll create their own little path. Do we need to put mulch there so it doesn't keep destroying the grass? And that mulch will help keep some of the mud down when you let the dog out to go to the bathroom and, and he's not dragging in all that mud and grass and stuff. Put some mulch or pine needles. They'll, they'll follow that path. But all these need to be noted, and that is part of your inventory. Your views, again, and this is how we're going to show this on the site plan or the drawing that we're going to set down with the client. We're going to have the good views. We're going to have, whoops, sorry about that. Went back too fast. The good views is going to be big, wide, open arrows that say good view. You don't even have to put good view. I'm going to know that this right here is a good view. That poor view is going to have that zigzag in between it, and that represents a poor view. It may be that the um, um, neighbor has their uh, uh, camper over there and you want to you want to block that view you may want to put some uh, larger evergreens over there potential view is just a smaller arrow with a little focal point symbol that could possibly be a potential view if we take down that tree or if we take down that row of leland cypress we might open up a view to downtown winston or a view to pilot mountain you know, just depending on where you're at and, and how the house is oriented. But always note the good, the poor, again, from the inside of the house and then any potential views that the client may possibly have. And, and again, it's hard sometimes for these homeowners to realize what potential views that they may have. They'll definitely notice a poor view and be like, I want to screen that out. 
Um, and then they may have, I've, I've had people that had one heck of a view of the mountain ranges in the back, but they wanted to plant a tree there. You know, part of my inventory is, ma'am, sir, that, that is an awesome view. Why would you want to cover that up? Well, again, it's their home. It's their choice. My inventory is, that's a good view. The analysis is, I don't plant a tree there. I keep that open. And then, uh, you know, help them out with their potential views. Also note their exposure to light, temperature, and then note the northeast, southwest side of the home. Why do we need to do that? Well, it depends all about the plant material that we're using. Um, some plants need more light than others. They need so many hours of daylight. Some plants may need so many hours of darkness to reset their buds. How many times have you planted mums in a shopping center uh, out front when you come into the shopping center and they've got street lights? Those mums bloom one time and that's it. They're not getting the, the hours of darkness required for them to, to reset their, um, their blooms. What about temperature? Is it hotter on one side of the house? Yeah, it's going to be hotter on the western side of the house. And so you don't want to plant those azaleas or rhododendrons there. They're going to be getting that hot, dry sun all day. You wouldn't want to plant them on the eastern side of the house. So note that, and we do that simply with the compass on our cell phone, it's right on that, on the four sides of the house, where north, south, east, and west are. And um, with that, it's going to be hard in some of these neighborhoods, especially the smaller lots. I mean, the builder could only put the house on one, uh, they could only put the, the house on a particular way on the lot and that's going to dictate where we can put some of these plants that our clients want you know the ideal place to have uh, your outdoor room or your patio uh, or your deck would be the eastern side of the house but we may not be able to just the way the house is positioned on the lot so as a landscaper and as a designer especially there's things that we can do to help the client still have that deck on the western side of the house and we'll plant them a shade tree so um, but you need to know where uh, north south east and west is when you're back at your uh, office designing the, the landscape form uh, and simple as this just you know you don't even have to put north but we know that north is going to be cool moist and shady uh, we know that the east is going to have morning sun it's going to be a comfortable afternoon we know that the south is going to be hot, dry, and sunny, and then the west is going to have afternoon sun, and it's going to be hot and dry. So you definitely don't want to have a deck uh, on the west or southern side of a home unless you're a sunbather and that's what you want. Uh, you'd prefer it on the east. Well, what if the, uh, what if the, uh, the back of the house is, is to the south? Again, this is where we'd plant our shade trees and, and move forward with, with our knowledge on how we can uh, problem solve for these clients. Um, this is pretty neat. This is uh, pretty good information. Uh, we have longer shadows in the winter. And why is that? That's because the sun is lower in the sky. In the summertime, it's higher in the sky. So if I'm standing here and I've got the sun over me, that shadow's coming down on top of me. It's going to cast a smaller, shorter shadow than if the sun is lower in the sky and hits me. And it's going to project a longer uh, shadow um, in the winter months. And why is this important? It all comes down to microclimates, again, for the plants. Some plants need more daylight. And if you've got... It may be getting the perfect amount of sunlight and daylight during the summertime, but in the wintertime, there may be shadows that cast on it, and that plant might not get any sunlight just by the position of the sun. And that's something that, you know, you're just going to have to uh, uh, to take notes of. You're going to have to go and see, and with your compass, and you write that on the map, you'll be able to predict why that's happening. I've had, had clients call me and say, hey, this plant of mine's not blooming. It's not blooming, but, but my neighbor down the street, theirs is on fire. It's gorgeous. It's blooming. And, well, they may be in full sun down the street, and it's getting the exact amount of sunlight, 
Well, this one over here may only get two hours of sunlight. And so they're wondering why theirs isn't blooming just like their neighbors. And what you do is you plant it, dig it up, plant it, and move it for them to where it's getting all the sunlight that is required. Again, northern exposure receives full shade most of the day. It stays cooler. It remains the, the, the moistest and dampest. That's why you'll see moss only growing on the north side of a, of a uh, tree. That's why you'll only see, uh, you'll still see snow hanging out on the roofs on the northern side uh, of a property. Um, southern exposure receives full sun and gets hotter than the northern exposure. This is why snow melts uh, on, the, on the south side of a hill before the north side. Same thing with the roof. Uh, northern exposure, uh, since sunlight enters from the south, the north side of the objects such as a house or trees uh, is shaded throughout most of the day. This is why moss grows on it again and where it's more shady and moist. So you may want to uh, have your plant materials that can stand a little bit more wet feet and definitely need the shade is where you'd want to have them on the northern side of the home. Uh, again, talking about the snow, you know, you're going to see it hanging out on the mountain or the roof side on a northern, on the northern slopes. It's going to melt quicker on that south. It's going to be in the sun all day. And so which exposure should we take a, a advantage of as a designer uh, or a landscape contractor? We want to take advantage of the eastern side of the how, house or property if at all possible. And again, it depends on the the property it depends on the location of the house on the property we may not be able to take advantage of that eastern side but we sure want to if we can um and which exposure should we uh, screen definitely the western and southern side if at all possible and guys this can actually help us be part of the green building craze that was you know was going on and i think it'll come back people are more energy conservative and 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 want to do right by nature so they they love this idea of, of implementing green ideas into their landscape and into their home and we can do that just take a brick house for example um, brick house absorbs all this heat during the summertime and it's going to make the house work. It's going to make the, the cooling, uh, uh, the, the, the air conditioning of the home, it's going to make it work harder if there's no shade on it. So we have hot summer. We've got the sun shining down on this red brick. It's just absorbing all this heat. The air conditioning unit is really working hard. Well, that's bad in the summer, but that's also helpful in the wintertime. That sun is beating down, heating that brick up, and keeping it a little bit warmer, and the heating system's not having to work as hard. But the air conditioning unit sure works its tail off in the summertime. Well, what can we do as a landscaper to help that? You plant the deciduous tree there uh, uh, on the side that's receiving all that sunlight and heat during the summertime. It's going to shade it. You've got a deciduous tree, it's still going to allow for summer breeze to come in through it, but you've got the sun that's being blocked by those leaves and not hitting the brick. And you can, you can, you can go touch brick, one that's shaded and one that's not, and feel the difference in heat, and that heat's just being absorbed into the house. Well, the tree loses all the leaves in the wintertime, it's allowing that sunlight to hit that brick and warm the house during the, the winter months. So we or just as big a part of the, the green, build is, green building uh, or certified energy homes and, and energy star, we can help with that just as much as any of the other trades people when it comes to building homes. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. The southern exposure, the deciduous tree is stopping that heat from hitting the house and keeping it cooler. And in the wintertime, the deciduous trees allows that allows that sunlight to hit the house and warm it up during the uh, the winter months. And so, a lot of times, homeowners may not even take that into consideration. And it'd be neat to see what the studies are on what these deciduous trees um, do for the properties.
All right. Again, we we're talking about the shadows. Look here in the winter. We've got that longer shadow that's hitting that shrub, and it's shorter right there. Well, they may be needing to set their buds this time of year, all right? But they need full sunlight. So something as simple as moving this out a little bit further would take care of that situation. Well, well Eric, my, my shrubs aren't blooming, and the neighbors are. Well, they're in full sun year-round. That shadow in the winter prevents that from happening. And they, and your clients would never, never, ever know that. So, winter, the shadow's longer, summer, or winter. Longer shadows happen in the winter. And why is this important to note? We just went over that. It's all about the bloom cycle of the plants. It may or may not bother an evergreen shrub, but a particular plant that needs so many hours of sunlight to set its buds or to bloom, you may need to take that into consideration. All right, something else with shadows. And I tell my students this at the college all the time. And we were talking about that in uh, construction class when we were building, uh, we were on our wood projects. And we were talking about trellises and, and um, shadows that are cast onto the ground could be implemented into the design. Now we can tell that this is a crepe myrtle just by well the trunk here but definitely by the shadows on the sidewalk that creates an interest on the brick pavers as you walk up to someone's house you're like wow those are some pretty cool shadows shining on the ground and if you had them on both sides um, you, you create that effect and seeing the shadows on the ground so that's something to incorporate into your design uh, and and something like crepe myrtle is not going to affect uh, it's not, you say that shrub needed so many hours of sunlight. That right there is not affecting that shrub right there because the sun is still coming through. And that's a pretty big crepe myrtle there, but it has excellent, excellent um, features that are neat to see and they need to be used in the design. There's nothing wrong with having those shadows there uh, and, and use it as a selling tool for your client. Hey, if we use the crepe myrtle here or if we use uh, a Japanese maple, you're going to have these, these shadows that are cast down on uh, onto uh, the pavement. Good selling point, which I think anyway. And same thing with the wood structures that we were talking about in construction class. You know, the, the pergolas and, and the arbors, they create a shadow uh, on the ground that's just as pretty as the structure itself. Um, inventory on this picture, guys, look. The inventory is that we have a northwest exposure, that we have winter winds that come in from the northwest. The analysis is I need to block this wind with a evergreen shrub or evergreen tree. Now, what have we just done here? We're blocking that wind, that cold wind from hitting that house, which is in return going to help not run the heating system as much. If that wind was hitting the house, that outside of that building or that house is going to be colder and it's going to cause the heating system to work a lot harder than it should. This tree is blocking that wind, which is going to give that home an insulating effect. Those plant materials are insulating that house from those prevailing northwestern winds. It's blocking it. It's going to reduce that windshield, which in turn conserves energy, conserves the energy, and uh, lowers the heating bill for that client, which in turn is part of green building and helps reduce our energy consumption by just the use of plant materials. And again, southwest exposure, we're blocking that summer heat, allows that summer breeze to, to cool that house, but it's blocking that hot summer sun right there. And then when it, well, when that tree becomes deciduous, it allows the heat, the sunlight to heat that house in the winter months. So um, good picture there. Uh, I know it's kind of a repeat of the, the earlier picture, but it, it shows you that it's blocking that heat. But we want that summer breeze to hit that house. And that's a good area there to possibly have, um, you know, the patio, even though that's southwest exposure. 
But with that deciduous tree, we could do our patio or we could do our deck there because we're not going to be so hot uh, during the, the summer months. Also note existing plants. Um, you know, got a red cedar there. Provides a good screen, so we'd want to keep it. Red maple, 20-foot wide canopy, 35 feet tall, has a good value. We got some scrubby forsythia here. Uh, consider replacing. So basically, we're making these notes of the plants in regards to the house. We want to know their condition, their size, the location, and whether or not they need to be removed or included in your design. So always note uh, your existing plants. That is your inventory, and the analysis is either we keep it or we get rid of it. All right, here's that picture that I talked about um, of the, uh, the live oak in the neighbor's yard. It's okay to enhance a view on someone else's property. They're sitting here underneath the covered deck, and they're out looking, and they see that gorgeous willow, not the willow, but that gorgeous live oak right there on their neighbor's property. Enhance that view. Don't put anything in front of it that's going to block that, because I love a live oak. I do. I was introduced to them by Dr. Glass at A&T. And, you know, fell in love with those trees ever since. So uh, big down in Texas is the, is the, uh, the live oaks. And, you know, we, we, we see them here every now and then. There's some Chili's uh, restaurants here in the triad that, uh, that we uh, visit that always have some live oaks in them. Um, but, um, you know, kind of a, an area we're at. It's a little bit, little bit cooler in the winter that they don't they don't like it they do better in, in the, uh, the warmer south but uh, still a good tree um, and they're enhancing that view uh, on the neighbor's property there uh, again with the existing plants note the condition their size or location whether or not they're going to be removed or included x would mean that you're going to remove it uh, the circle with the uh, center out of it means that it's existing and that you're going to keep it and incorporate it into your design. Soil. Note the texture of the soil. Um, note the percent sand and silt. Uh, you can do that with uh, the jar test or, or, or uh, um, you know, the ribbon test, you know, squeezing the soil in your hand, or we can do a soil test. And hopefully, guys, that you do a soil test on every site that you have. You're definitely doing it if it's in lawn care, and you definitely need to do it if you're doing a landscape design or doing an installation for your clients. Soil test, you know, uh, I know the state's charging now certain times of the year. Uh, state of North Carolina, it's just a, a certain time of year that they charge. Other times of the year, it's free, or you can take it somewhere. I remember Lesco used to do it, but now it's uh, site one. They still do it. Uh, you take that over there and you get it back fairly quick. Uh, if you take it somewhere like site one, you'll get that turned in a couple days for you. And that could be something that you go and do at that initial consultation. You're there doing your site inventory and analysis. Go ahead and do the soil test. Take it. Send it off. Charge your client for it. But you need to know exactly what type of soil that the client has. And that ribbon test, you roll that handful of moist soil and squeeze uh, between your thumb and fingers and your palm is in this figure 3-3-2 here. Uh, and if it's uh, uh, no ribbon, it's at least 50% sand. It's not sticking together. If it's uh, between 2 and 3.5 three and inches, it's roughly 40% clay. And if it's greater than 3.5, you've got at least 50% clay. Uh, and so that's a pretty good quick test that you can do there uh, on the property. And here's the jar test. Uh, you know, you fill it up, put water in it, and you're going to see it settle out. Um, it's going to be sand if it's 80 to 80 percent, 80 to 100 percent sand, uh, 10 to 30 clay, 30 to 50 silt, and 25 to 50 percent sand is going to be your loam soils. And if it's between 50 and 100 percent clay, it's going to be a clay soil. So easy to do there. Uh, you know, a little bit lengthier time to do this, but um, it's one way to get it done. And our good old soil triangle that we teach in our soils class. Our students get tired of seeing this. Um, 
with uh, with your soil. You know, what type of soil do they have? That is your inventory. What are we going to do about this soil is your analysis. Uh, is it compacted? Well, you need to have compacted soil to, to put the driveway on. And uh, you need to have a good structure of soil, at least 25% air and 25% water and 50% soil to have that good good planting base. And, you know, you may want to have to add some soil amendments depending on what your soil test comes back on. Adding that soil conditioner, that peat moss, and creating a good planting bed for your clients. And we want a 6.5 pH is ideal for most plant material. 7 is neutral. Uh, and as we move uh, from, you know, below 7, it's getting more acidic. And, you know, the higher from 7 it gets, it's becoming more basic. Again, this is part of inventory, and your clients need to know that. And you can provide that information for them. Um, oops, duplicate. Uh, berms, uh, landforms on the house. And basically, this is all about water. Now, good picture here, bad picture here. Berms can be good. Berms are going to uh, either... Uh, channel water away from the house or they're going to channel it back towards the house. Now this is definitely a problem here, this lower picture. That berm is preventing the water from coming off the house and getting away from the house. You want at least a 1% minimum slope of paved areas from a house and at least 2% on mulch and turf. And I'd like to see it a little bit more than that. That kind of scares me uh, a little bit. But I want to see water running away from my house. And this is definitely not what you want to see. This is perfect. Running it down here, the berm stopping it, and you'll be able to channel that water away from the house. How can we uh, take care of steep slopes? We can do it either with vegetation or we can stair step it. Definitely with vegetation, it's going to be uh, the, uh, the better, um, uh, the cheapest route to go, especially for using like a ground cover type grass or a juniper. But when you start terracing it off, uh, that becomes expensive, but what this does give our client is extra uh, room for plant materials and extra room for garden space if they're into that. And some people just have hilly areas. I mean, they have a the backyard is nothing but a hill. Do they want to mow it or do they want some type of terracing? That gives us all kinds of uh, things we can do. It just depends on their budget and, and what you're uh, capable of doing. Again, getting that drainage away from the house, they're getting it into a channel and running it away, or they're just eventually getting it all away from the house and letting it run for it. But make sure it's not running on to the neighbor's property uh, as well, or they can get in trouble for that. Here we have uh, uh, a topo map, the topography. Uh, we've got this on the plan, uh, and it's kind of hard for some people to see this, but if you did, if you just drew your lines up, you can actually see how steep that hill is and, and uh, from the topo. The bad thing about it, your site plans don't have these on them anymore. Um, you know, you may have to get a surveyor if you needed uh, your topo put on your site plan. And, you know, surveyors, you know, they're out there working hard too. And you can get it done uh, fairly reasonable. And what I've had happened before. I had a client one time that did not have a survey. I couldn't find it on Geodata. I did give the client a name and number of a survey surveyor. They hired the surveyor. He sent me the, um, the site plan in AutoCAD. I was able to pull it in AutoCAD, able to pull it into Pro Landscape, so it worked out good for me. I think she spent 350 bucks, but this was it's almost, wow, probably 18, 19 years ago. Uh, that uh, she did that, but it was uh, fairly inexpensive for her, and I was able to, to go right to work with the site plan, made my money, we sold the job, we sold the design, and sold the install, So, and that was all about client consultation. We knew right from the get-go that this client was serious. They did our survey. We give them the name and number of a, a surveyor, and uh, we got our site plan. Um, topography again is just noting some pipes in the ground, uh, you know, the different elevations and where the drain inlet is there. Um, again, we're probably not going to see this on a residential site plan. Um, but again, note your inventory. We have a wet area. We have gutters. We have downspouts that are broken that are creating 
uh, a wet spot. The wet spot is part of the inventory analysis is how do we get rid of it? Do we need to further extend the, uh, the drainage pipe? Do we need to replace a section of the buried downspout? So all of that would be your analysis. But always note your wet areas, you know, the foundation, where the surface drainage is, and where the gutters are. Always note on your site plan on the house where the gutters are coming down at because that may be where the client wants to plant some feet, uh, plant some plants that do not need wet feet. So we would either have to pipe them off or we'd have to move the plants to a different area for our client. Again, just noting the downspouts. And, or, you know, make sure that the, the, the rainfall is getting away from the house. All that, just mark it on your, uh, you don't have to draw this, but at least mark where the downspouts are on the site plan. Again, drawing the analysis, here's your primary circulation, the thicker arrows, the secondary, a major view. It's like your primary, all your primary and your bigger stuff is going to be the wider arrows. A blocked view is just that squiggly, looks like a, uh, scan of the heart EKG or uh, um, when they put the leads on your heart. Screening is squiggly lines. A focal point is a star. Focused view would be just a regular arrow. Panoramic view is the, the wider view. Or we can draw our screening uh, like this. So good ways to draw that. Uh, and drawing it, make sure that you do it either in Sharpies, colored markers, pencil. It needs to be freehand, especially when you're walking around the site. Um, you know, you can go back to your office and do a nice one if you're including it part of your, your package. But uh, typically, I don't, I don't do a big rendered drawing of site inventory and analysis for a residential client. Uh, but you know, use as many symbols as possible, and the fewer the words, um, the better. Um, the better we are for uh, for our site inventory and analysis. Again, site inventory, you're observant. You're the observer. Identify and record the existing conditions and existing elements of the site. You can call it data collection. Note what it is and where it is. Your analysis is you're analyzing what's there, named as data evaluation. It can evaluate. You're evaluating or making a judgment about the worth or importance of the condition. Is it good or is it bad? Is it functional or not? And how do we take care of it? What will be, what will be the problem solver for this? Make sure you are correcting these situations. You're being uh, analytical. And here's a quick uh, site inventory um, of a house. You know, here's a private living room, main living area. We've got our views coming out these windows. Um, you got shallow, rocky soil. We got drainage that's coming across the property. We got road noise here, road noise. You got sunrise coming up here. So here's our east. You got a uh, you got a summer breeze that comes through here. You got winter winds up here. You got the sun, the summer sunset. You got views out this window, views out here, out here. Um, so good, good note taking here. And this is what it should look like if you're going to do it in color. Um, but a very good um, sample here. They've done it in one. To, uh, they've done it in ten scale, and then they've got the north arrow. They've noted that um, wet areas. Looks like they've got wet areas here. Uh, got a wooden fence, overhead electrical lines going right here. Uh, you got a utility pole going right there. Drainage path, direction of the sunrise, noise source. And they've got all this. So, this is a good inventory and analysis. So, when they get back to the office and they're designing, or if they're putting in an irrigation system, they know it's going to be a little tougher right here with this shallow rocky soil. So they've got all this good notes about this property. And why is it hot right here? You know, you got the sun, um, and you got it coming over here, easterly direction, north is to that way. So you got the west right here. So that's why it's hot in that area. So they would need some shade trees on that um, patio that they're designing for them. 
another uh, example of how to do it. I know the uh, um, the writing's a little bit bad, but uh, got the north drawn in. You got where the sun sets. Um, got the mountain view there. Done a little bit different here. This is a uh, little bit larger property, but uh, still uh, very very similar on how you draw your inventory and analysis. And this is maybe something that what it would look like when we finish walking around our client's property. We've got it sketched in here. Um, utilities above the ground, existing trees small. We have an open view from the street here. Um, we've got water from the downspout hitting the, uh, the driveway. We've got our sidewalk going in. Uh, we've got a fence. We've got a workbench, we've got the trash cans, all this is gravel, so that's a pretty good area. We've got our AC units, other utilities, we've got gutters coming down right here. Uh, all this is sod, there's a swale here to get water away. Existing trees are healthy. Uh, we have an open, exposed feeling here. We've got sod, we've got a low area, we've got a high sun area, all this is sod. We got the patio. We got good views coming out from the house, and then from the uh, from the patio looking out, it'd be a good spot for a play area. That's an analysis that that could be used for a play area. We'd want a play area off the patio because mom probably wants to sit there or dad and watch the kids play, uh, especially when they're younger. So we may have something like this to set down with our client at the kitchen table. So. Uh, I know this wraps this class up. The lecture's roughly at an hour. What I'm going to do now is put up some examples uh, on, the, on the website that you can uh, see uh, some samples of how to do uh, more site inventory and analysis. Again, the site inventory and analysis should be um, conducted very close to the client consultation. And I'll tell you how I do it. I get the phone call. I determine whether or not I want to work for the client. I'm going to ask them for that site survey or the site plan. I'm going to blow it up. Um, if they can give it to me, or I'm going to download it off the Geodata website. And I'm going to draw the, the property. I'm going to get to the client's house about 15 minutes early. Uh, then I'm supposed to meet with them. I'm going to walk around the house, take pictures. And I'm going to do that quick site inventory analysis. I'm going to write it on the the paper and I'm picking out the major issues and the, the major things. Now, yes, you may want to have to go back and do it after you've talked with them at the, t at the kitchen table and, and make some more notes because they may have given you some more information. So roughly with a design client, before I get a down payment, I've probably got about anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes, maybe even an hour because I want to impress them. I want to sit down at that table. I want to show them the pictures of their property. I want to show them that inventory and analysis that I've done sitting there. Now, take you got you got to remember if I'm designing, it's one thing. I'm going to be a little more detailed than I was if I'm going to pick up a set of plans and price for them. I'm still going to do that site inventory and analysis because it's going to help me. But I'm picking up the plans. And I'm not going to do so much. I'm definitely not going to do it as graphically. And if I'm doing irrigation, I still need to do site inventory and analysis. I need to see that site, take note of what's there, and how do I need to overcome these problems. So, But if I'm designing, it's going to be more graphically. I'm going to sit down at the table with them, and I'm going to show them uh, a little more detail than I would if I'm doing an install that somebody's already designed. So anyway, thanks for uh, taking this class. I appreciate your guys' business. I'll put up some samples for you to live, uh, to see, and uh, take the quiz, and you'll be done with the course. Appreciate it.